everybody. Welcome to WTF Hammer Underworlds. So we're nearing the end of Beast Grave Season 3 Warband Reviews. This time we're looking at the third to last of the Warbands that was released, specifically the Worm Spat. We're basically, I guess, accidentally in Beast Grave, having been eaten and regurgitated into the mountain where they're stuck in that endless cycle of death and rebirth. And in this video, what I'll be doing is looking at this Warband's fighter cards, their faction-specific cards, and I'm going to rate them and compare them to the other Warbands that I've rated, which is very numerous at this point, so we can just see where these guys line up in the big scheme of things. Starting by looking at the fighter cards, we have our second Elite Warband released for Beast Grave. First was Ripa's Snarl Fangs with three units, and now we have the Worm Spat, who have an interesting Inspire mechanic where three or more enemy fighters need to be either out of action or have taken wound tokens, or some combination of it. We're going to start by looking at Fecula, the leader, who is definitely hardy, definitely sturdy. Three movement, one shield, four wounds before and after being inspired. Good melee attack, especially when inspired, getting three hammers and two damage, which is very accurate. And a very interesting spell attack action, which is pretty standard when uninspired, landing on focus, doing a damage. But when getting inspired, instead of getting an extra damage like a lot of other warbands do who have a spellcaster leader, Instead, the die changes to channel, which is actually really accurate. So she gets a really accurate range spell attack action, which is cool. And her, along with all other fighters in this warband, reduce damage dealt to them whenever they roll a shield in the defense roll, which is a very, very powerful mechanic, making it very hard to reliably take them out of action. So aside from Fecula, we have Ghoul Gok, or Ghoul Gotch the Butcher, who is just super accurate, super tough, so very similar to Fecula. When he starts off, although he's more accurate, obviously three hammers, two damage, no spell attack action, getting two shields when inspired, which is very powerful combined with that special ability for reducing damage, and gets cleave, making him even more accurate, which is very nice. And finally, Sepsimus, who has a two range spear, which is nice, two hammers, two damage, otherwise similar stats to the other units in the warband, getting two shield when inspired, which is great. Going up to 3 damage with the spear and also getting a melee scything attack that lands on 3 swords doing 2 damage, which is great. So overall, good units, obviously struggle in movement. Let's just take a look at the pros and cons overall of this warband. Pros being that they have special combat abilities. They have cleave when inspired, they have scything when inspired, both are nice. They have that toughness special ability, which is very, very nice. They have a spellcaster, they have high wounds for across the board, plus they're especially durable because of their special ability. They have high accuracy, they have ranged capabilities, they have range 1, 2, and 3 attacks. And they have a low model number, which makes it so that there are few targets, so it's hard for aggressive warbands to really profit from taking these guys out, especially since they're so unpredictably tough. Cons being that they have a tricky inspire condition, requiring that they kind of spread out and attack different units, which is, you know, typically against the strategy of people who want to get a unit taken out of action and get a glory point for it. They have low movement, which is really harmful, and the low model number also yields fewer options, especially when it comes to holding objectives and that kind of positional play. So that covers that. Let's take a look at their objective cards. They have three surges. First surge is Blessed Endurance. Score this immediately when an attack action with a damage characteristic of three or more targets a friendly fighter and succeeds if the friendly fighter is not taken out of action. Worth one glory. So I'm giving it a B. It's tough. Is really a reactionary type of card that depends on what your opponent does. You might have an opponent that doesn't even land three damage on an attack. Although obviously if a fighter does have a three damage characteristic, it is pretty good odds that one of your units will survive it considering they have that toughness mechanic. Next is Fell the Faithless. Score this immediately when an enemy leader is taken out of action, only worth one. I'm giving that a C because with the low movement it's very hard to bridge that gap if people are playing warbands where they're kind of hiding their leader in the back. Next is Seeping Rot. Scores immediately when a friendly fighter holding an objective is the target of an attack action and is not driven back. If that fighter survives, worth one glory. So I gave this an A, but upon second reading it might be worth a B. Because you have to dedicate one of your guys to holding an objective, get hit, not be driven back, which either means that the attack misses, which is possible because the guys are... Because two units have two shields, or that you've gone on guard or something. It definitely does depend on a lot of conditions. Anyway, that does it for the Surges. For the score in the end phase card, there's Blessings 3. Score this in an end phase if any surviving friendly fighter has three or more upgrades, worth one. So pretty likely to score this eventually, but it's only worth one in an end phase. If you draw in the first phase, you're probably not going to be scoring it. So I'm just giving it a B. 
Next is Chosen Warriors. For two glory, score this an end phase if there are one or more surviving friendly fighters and three or more enemy fighters are out of action. So a nice aggro card. I'm giving it a B. Could be worth an A because these guys are good at killing but can't be scored in the first round so it would be a crappy first round draw. Or at least it's unlikely to be scored in the first round. Next is Cycle of Decay. Score this an end phase if you played two or more cycle ploys in the preceding action phase worth one. I'm giving it a B. I mean, cycle ploys aren't even that great, but I'll get to those soon. Faithful Reward. Score this in end phase if each surviving friendly fighter is inspired. Worth one. So this one's okay. If it was worth more than one glory, it would be worth an A or an S. Because when one fighter gets inspired, they're all getting inspired. But I decided to give this a B. Rockbringers. Score this in end phase if your warband successfully cast two or more spells in the preceding action phase. Worth one. I'm giving it an A. It's pretty easy to pull off since Specula has a spell attack action and a very accurate one when inspired, but it's only worth one in an end phase. Sacred Trilobe. Scores an end phase if your warband holds three or more objectives worth three glory. I'm giving this a D. Requires all of your resources be spent holding objectives and it's basically just supremacy, which I don't believe is the best strategy for any elite warband. Spread his blessings. It's worth one glory. Scores an end phase if your warband holds one or more objectives in enemy territory worth one. I'm giving this a B. It's okay. Definitely scorable. Definitely not amazing. And that does it for the main objective cards, I guess. Now the score in the third end phase cards is two. There's Nurgle's Garden Grows, which is a hybrid. Score this if there are no enemy fighters in your territory, or if your warband holds more objectives than each opposing warband, worth two glory. I'm giving it a C. The denial aspect is nice if that happens to turn out. The holding the most objectives is pretty unlikely unless you basically TPK'd the enemy. And finally, Strength of the Devoted. Score this in the third end phase if no friendly fighters are out of action. Worth three. I'm giving this a D because it's very hard to reliably not let any of your units get taken out of action. Even though these guys are tough, I don't see it happening. Unless you're playing against an incredibly passive warband. So that does it for the objective cards, which typically promote taking enemy fighters out of action in various ways, holding objectives and not being driven back off of them, upgrading friendly fighters, playing cycle ploys, casting spells, inspiring, casting spells twice, I wrote that twice, sorry about that, surviving, keeping enemies out of friendly territory. And that does it for those, so let's take a look at this Warband's power cards. Starting with the Gambits, they have seven ploys, three spells. First ploy is Blessing of Rust. Choose an enemy fighter adjacent to one or more friendly fighters. The chosen fighter's defense characteristic is dodge. This effect persists until the chosen fighter is taken out of action. So a nice debuff to units that have block defense. It's okay. I'm giving it a B. Next is Fecund Vigor, which is a cycle. You can reroll one attack dice in friendly fighter's attack rolls. This effect persists until after the next attack action made by a friendly fighter, the end of the round, or you play another cycle ploy. So it's sort of a persistent reroll that you can take at some point and then this card is used up. So I'm gonna give that a B, it's okay. Improves accuracy. Having it last longer isn't necessarily valuable, but it is what it is. Nauseous Revulsion, another cycle. Minus one dice from attack actions made by enemy fighters adjacent to one or more friendly fighters. This effect persists until the end of the round or you play another cycle ploy. So this one's very good, I'm giving it an A. Very good counter melee, obviously has no effect against ranged warbands, but most of the warbands are melee anyway, so this is definitely useful. Next is Rampant Disease, another cycle ploy. Roll one attack dice for each enemy fighter adjacent to one or more friendly fighters. For each crit, that enemy fighter is dealt one damage, which is pretty low odds of doing damage, requires you to be adjacent to them. So I'm going to give this a C. Could be worth a higher score if it didn't require crits, which is very unlikely to happen. Next is Steady Advance. Choose up two friendly fighters and push each chosen fighter one hex. Amazing for this warband. I'm giving it an A. Could be worth an S. Probably worth an S. Because these guys have heavy movement difficulties. Next is the Burgeoning. Another cycle ploy. Heal one to the first friendly fighter that moves, is placed, pushed, or driven back into a lethal hex. That fighter is not dealt damage from the lethal hex. This effect persists until the friendly fighter is healed in this way or you played another cycle ploy. So an interesting way of adding a cool mechanic to having your guys heal could also be coupled with the fact that these guys have low movement so that at least once they can move through a lethal hex profit from it and then attack an enemy so i'm going to give this an s although it could be worth an a it's pretty borderline s next is unnatural vitality plus one move to a friendly fighters this effect persists until the end of the round or you play another cycle ploy so a nice move that applies for the whole round as so long as you don't play another cycle ploy i'm giving that an a and that does it for the ploys. 
Next are the spells, starting with Blades of Putrefaction. It's a gambit spell that succeeds on a focus. If cast friendly fighters range one and range two attacks have plus one damage on a critical hit, this spell persists until the end of the round. So I'm giving it a B, still requires the crit. If it was a straight up plus one damage, I'd give this an S. Next is Gift of Contagion, Gambit spell. If cast, choose one enemy fighter within three hexes of the caster, minus one damage from the chosen fighter's attack actions. This spell persists until the end of the round or the chosen fighter is taken out of action. So nice little debuff, nothing too amazing, pretty easy to cast, I'm giving it an A. And finally, Rancid Visitations. Two channel cast, each enemy fighter adjacent to the caster is dealt one damage, so it requires you to get right in there with Fecula. Hard to cast this spell, I'm only going to give it a B. And that does it for the Gambits, which typically promote reducing enemy defense, accuracy, and damage, improving friendly accuracy and damage, pushing friendly fighters, causing damage, healing or ignoring lethal hexes, and improving movement. So now we're going to move on to the final batch of cards, which are the upgrades, starting with Fly Swarm. Minus one dice from attack actions with a range of three or more that target this fighter. So a good anti-range upgrade, which is nice for such a slow moving warband. I'm going to give it a C though, because it is incredibly circumstantial. Next is Feated or Foated Shroud. You can reroll one dice in this fighter's defense rolls. Applies only to Fecula, who only has one defense die. I'm going to give this a B. Could be worth a C, not very useful. Next is Hulking Physique, which is a cool card, restricted to Gulgok. Kind of a sudden growth, great strength hybrid, minus one move, plus one wound, plus one damage. So very good. I'm giving that an A. Makes him very slow, but just hardy and scary. Next is Living Plague. As a reaction after an enemy fighter's successful range one attack action that targets this fighter, roll a defense dice on a roll of shield or crit. So 50% chance that the enemy fighter is dealt a damage. So definitely a nice deterrent against enemies who want to engage this warband in melee. I'm giving it a B because it's not a sure thing. Might be worth an A. Next is Pestilent Deliverer. This fighter's attack actions made as part of a charge action have cleave. For Sepsimus. So it's nice, but it is restricted to charges. But for that scything attack, it could be pretty powerful. I'm giving it a C though. Universal cards are just a better option. Next is Putrid Vomit, which is just a good range attack for Fecula or Gulgok. I guess Sepsimus can't do it because he has a mask on, but it's three swords, one damage. It's okay. Fecula's spell attack action is obviously better, but for Gulgok, it does give him a little bit of variety in terms of his attack options. Only giving it a C though, because his melee is just far superior. There's Retchling, restricted to Fecula. Each time this fighter attempts to cast a spell after the casting roll, you can change one of the symbols roll to a channel. In addition, the fighter cannot be dealt damage by Backlash. So the anti-Backlash is very nice, makes the Swarband even tougher, because Fecula could obviously be hurt by Backlash and be drained that way. So I'm giving this an S. Works amazing with the inspired range attack action. Next is Stolid Bulk. Fighter cannot be driven back. Works well for that card, whose name I forget, where if you're not driven back off an objective, I'm giving it a B. Could be worth an A because if this warband gets knocked back, it makes it even harder to cover the distance, especially against ranged warbands. There's Unstoppable Tread. As a reaction after this fighter's activation, push this fighter one hex. So pretty nice, allows him to cover more ground. I'm giving this an A. And finally, Virulent Blade. You can re-roll one attack dice in this fighter's attack rolls for range one and two attack actions for Gulgok and Sepsimus. I'm giving that an A, that's always nice. And that basically covers all the cards at this point. So the upgrades typically promote improving accuracy and spell casting success chance, improving defense, reducing enemy ranged attack accuracy, buffing Gulgok, preventing drive back, causing damage, improving range, pushing friendly fighters, and, and an unexceptional weapon upgrade. So here is the full overview. So gambits and upgrades are honestly okay. Most are not cards that you're definitely gonna put into your deck, but I mean, they are interesting. Objectives is where this Warband gets a little bit wonky with their two score and the third end phase cards with their faction specific supremacy. Their objective cards are pretty weak. So that basically does it. So now I'm gonna take a look at this Warband as a whole and rate it on that scale of S to D to compare to other Warbands. So first point, this Warband is very tough, possibly the toughest Warband, although Morgox is pretty tough too, and Thundrix is also pretty hardy, but these guys are kind of unpredictably tough, which is interesting. They have a great special ability that makes it unpredictable and difficult to take these guys out of action. However, their objective cards strongly encourage holding objectives, which is typically not the strong suit of a low unit Warband with no special movement mechanics. I mean, they have a couple 
power cards that help them get pushed or move a little bit more, but not enough to justify needing to hold three objectives with three units. They also have an inspire condition that requires pinging three different enemies, which can leave those enemies alive, which is not ideal because typically you want to take enemies out of action so that the enemy cannot use them, obviously, and plus you will score glory points for taking them out of action. <laughs> Makes this inspire condition a little bit tricky in that sense. And finally, this warband is technically versatile. They can perform spell casting, they can hold objectives, they're aggressive. So in that sense, you know, they seem sort of like a jack of all trades. But practically, they can do generally well in each area, but they struggle in movement and in unit number in order to be exceptional. So they're pretty lacking in all three areas. Their aggro, I'd say, is quite strong, although the movement does make a bit of a difficult thing to achieve as well. So with all this in mind, I've decided to rate this warband as a B. So all warbands that I've reviewed so far for B Scrape have landed in either the A or S tier. Wormspat so far is the worst of season three, ranking as a B. And this is where I put them in the overall grid ahead of Ilthari's Guardians, because Ilthari does have a ton of issues. It's very unfocused, a little bit squishy. But I do put them behind Spike Claw's Swarm, just because Spike Claw's Swarm is very versatile. They have that ability to summon dead Skaven. Their ability to take advantage of combo attacks with the Hungering Skaven and such is very powerful. They're good at holding objectives. So I, I would have to put them behind the Skaven, but ahead of Ilthari's in the B tier. And obviously feel free to pause this, pause this video, check out this whole list, think about it, see if you like it, comment below, like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. And as I always do, I'm going to be putting a link for the balancing recommendations that I'm going to be putting together for as to how I think Games Workshop should make modifications to this warband in order to make them more balanced with other warbands that I have balanced around the A tier. So check that out if you're interested. Thanks again for watching this video and I hope you all have a nice day.